and welcome to the 50th anniversary of ASEAN Special Lecture Series. Today, we are honored to have with us His Excellency Ambassador Ong Kin Yong, former Secretary General of ASEAN, who will deliver a special lecture on ASEAN in the next 50 years. To begin the program, ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the ASEAN Anthem, The ASEAN Way. Next, we would like to present you a short video presentation depicting ASEAN's journey from day one and looking ahead into the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy the presentation of ASEAN's past, present, and future. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to officially begin the program, may I invite His Excellency Ambassador Pradapibun Songkram, advisor to the Department of ASEAN Affairs, to kindly deliver the welcoming remarks, please. Excellencies, Ambassador Ong Kim Yong, former Secretary General of ASEAN, ambassadors, member of diplomatic corps, 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. We are honored to have His Excellency Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, former Secretary General of ASEAN, joining us in Bangkok as our keynote speaker today. This year is special as we have reached the 50th anniversary of ASEAN and in Thailand, as many of you have already witnessed, we commemorate this anniversary under the theme ASEAN at 50 for now and posterity. Since the signing of ASEAN Declaration on August 8, 1967 in Bangkok, ASEAN has developed very far. We have come very far with impressive outcomes. ASEAN has gone through difficult times, especially in the Cold War period, but we have persevered. In time, we became more closely integrated economically as we changed battlefields into marketplaces and started the process of drafting a charter, building a community and putting people at the center of our policies. 50 years later, we are resolved more than ever to make ASEAN more resilient, inclusive, outward-looking, and future-oriented. The ASEAN Charter in 2008 have made ASEAN more cohesive and robust, as have the Asha'am Hohin Declaration and Community Blueprint. Now, ASEAN is one successful model for promoting regional peace, security, economic integration, and institution building. And for this, we are grateful to you, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, for your insights, vision, and leadership during your tenure as Secretary General which provided an impetus to our joint community building effort. You had effectively supported the work of ASEAN family of 10 during, your early, during the early period when their 10 came together. You had given valuable contribution to the success of the draft to the High Level Task Force on ASEAN Charter. ASEAN efforts finally led to the establishment of the ASEAN community in 2015, which is now the sixth largest economy in the world, with strong commitment and peace and stability. To provide for prosperity in ASEAN and beyond, let us turn our focus to the future. The world is changing fast, not just in Southeast Asia, but also in other regions. For ASEAN centrality to work, ASEAN has to think ahead and beyond. We have ASEAN Vision 2025, but maybe, maybe we ought to prepare for ASEAN Vision 2050. ASEAN future is a 50, ASEAN future in the next 50 years will likely contain as many opportunities and challenges and hope this forum will uh, take advantage of the presence of such experienced uh, diplomat as uh, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong and uh, ask him the various opportunities and uh, challenges. As we handle global makeup trends, more complex traditional and non-traditional issues. One thing that is certain, though, ASEAN will continue to be active and credible global partner, especially in addressing international issues of common concern and bedrock of regional stability as we advance to promote and protect the interests of all Southeast Asian nations. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I recall a motto of one of the Southeast Asian games that was hosted by Thailand many years ago. It read simply, ever onward, ever onward. 
This is, that is so true for ASEAN. As we commemorate 50 years of achievements, we should never forget that greater tasks and challenges remain before us. And so ASEAN owes it to past and future generations to continue to move forward to fulfill both old and new dreams and to ensure that ASEAN indeed remains for posterity. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the welcoming remarks. And now may I invite Dr. Surya Jinda Wong, the Director General of the Department of ASEAN Affairs, onto the stage to kindly deliver the introductory remarks, please. Uh, good morning to you all, and thank you for joining us today at this very special event. As I've remarked in the past, it's very difficult to be the second speaker, you know, speaking after Kun Prada, and then to speak right before Ong Keng Yong. Uh, if, if you recall in a, in a, a full-course meal, Kun Prada is probably the main appetizer. Ong Keng Yong is the main course that leads me to be, I guess, the sorbet, you know, that right in between. But um, I hope it doesn't leave a sour taste in your mouth, but rather to help think a little bit, um, uh, give a chance for Ong Keng Yong to gather his thoughts, which he has already. But for me, simply to say that uh, I've worked with Ong Keng Yong for a number of years when he was Secretary General of ASEAN. Uh, in many ways, he exemplifies what ASEAN is about, uh, defending national interests, but at the same time working for regional interests. Um, I don't want to go through his CV. We all know who he is. Uh, he's uh, with the S. Rajaratnam School right now, but he's also ambassador at large of Singapore Foreign Ministry. Uh, but simply just before handing over the floor to him, which I'm very eager to hear, to say that um, I think Ong Keng Yong and, and many others, including those in this room, you are really the key reasons why ASEAN has been a successful achievement in the past. Uh, but we would also look forward to the continued energies and ideas and visions of all of us for ASEAN to move into the future. Um, and if I may be so bold, Ong Keng Yong, I think in many ways we cannot think of just the 10 because we are so integrated and inter interconnected with the rest of the world that we have to start thinking also beyond ASEAN. And so without any further words, as you finish this sorbet, I have great pleasure in taking you to the main course and therefore invite His Excellency Ong Keng Yong to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Surya, for that uh, nice uh, introduction. And thank you, uh, Ambassador Pradap, for uh, setting the stage for this uh, morning's uh, lecture. Actually, as I step into this room, I must confess that I did not inform Singapore Foreign Ministry that I was coming here. Uh, so, Ambassador Chua, please uh, uh, apologize if you have to write something back about this lecture. Uh, but I want to uh, talk about ASEAN in my capacity as a former Secretary General of ASEAN. As you saw the video just now, I was number 11. And uh, it has already been 10 years since I left uh, my ASEAN uh, former job. Uh, but I must say that these past 10 years, I have been uh, still talking about uh, ASEAN and uh, try my best to promote ASEAN. When I was asked to become the Secretary General of ASEAN back in December 2002, then Prime Minister of Singapore, Go Chok Tong, uh, told me that you just have to remember you are now the ASEAN Secretary General, not the Singapore Secretary General, and you have to promote ASEAN. And before I say goodbye to him, I went to see Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, but he did not want to have a formal discussion with me. He just told me that ASEAN is the only one we have. Do the best you can for ASEAN. So from my immediate boss, Mr. Go Chak Tong, and our... First, Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, the 
message was very clear. I have to work for ASEAN and do what I can for ASEAN. Well, first of all, let me thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Thailand for this kind invitation. I have been to Bangkok many times, but I have yet to make such a formal uh, speech or lecture in front of uh, all my friends and colleagues from the diplomatic service of ASEAN countries and many friendly other countries in Bangkok. So I hope you will uh, be generous in your uh, response to my uh, remarks. Hopefully, this will contribute to what we already have in ASEAN. ASEAN has been relatively successful in its first 50 years. There are several important achievements, no matter how much the critics would say otherwise. The Bangkok Declaration, which you saw just now on the video, establishing ASEAN on 8 August 1967, remained the single most profound diplomatic accomplishment in the Southeast Asian history of the past five decades. By the way, the original document, the Bangkok Declaration, is still in the custody of Thailand. Yeah, ASEAN Secretary tried to ask for the original copy, and uh, I was told to uh, write in formally, and there would be a parliamentary debate about how to transfer this uh, archival uh, document to Jakarta. So I decided maybe save myself all the trouble. <laughs> After all, the Thais are good uh, archival uh, protector, so they can keep the uh, original Bangkok Declaration in Bangkok. With ASEAN, Southeast Asia is a very different place compared to the preceding period. The famously diverse Southeast Asian region is open, accessible, and peaceful. More importantly, the region is looking to the future with a plan for progress. Countries from around the world are engaged with ASEAN. Almost 90 of them have formal diplomatic ties with ASEAN. More than 100 million tourists travel through ASEAN member states every year. As a collective, ASEAN is the world's sixth largest economy today, after the United States of America, China, Japan, Germany, and the United Kingdom. A key decision in the development of ASEAN is the establishment of the ASEAN Free Trade Area AFTA back in 1992. This laid the foundation for the ASEAN Economic Community, AEC, one of the three pillars of the ASEAN community. After AFTA was implemented, tariffs came down or disappeared and trade and commerce flourish in the ASEAN region. To ensure continued success, ASEAN needs to further consolidate economic integration, capitalize on favorable demographic factors, and harness the skills of today's tech-savvy youth to write the digital revolution. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the wake of the 1998 Asian financial crisis, ASEAN faced significant competition from the then emerging economies of China and India. At that time, foreign direct investment, FDI, into ASEAN shrunk by two-thirds and aggregate economic growth dropped by 50%. This was in stark contrast to China's surging FDI and its export and growth in GDP at that time. Southeast Asia was seen as losing its competitiveness and ASEAN could no longer compete on low cost of production alone. 
Against this backdrop, a few ASEAN leaders persuaded all their counterparts that it was necessary to do a well-researched competitiveness study. Vietnam, Laos, Myanmar and Cambodia had newly joined ASEAN at that time, but believed that such a study was in the right direction. Subsequently, McKinsey and Company, a private sector consultancy group, was commissioned to understudy to undertake the study on the region's economic competitiveness. To be sure, the ASEAN leaders were also ably assisted by their respective ministers and senior officials in this endeavour. The McKinsey report is now almost forgotten, but it must be credited with providing ASEAN governments with a solid proposal on moving forward on economic integration for the region. The study estimated that a fully integrated ASEAN economy could raise ASEAN GDP by as much as 10% while reducing the operational cost by up to 20%, operational cost of transacting commercial activities across the ASEAN countries. The study stressed that Southeast Asia would lose out eventually as a result of the competition from China and India and warn of dire consequences if ASEAN did not become competitive through economic integration. As a follow-up to the ASEAN competitiveness study by McKinsey and company, a high-level task force was established by the ASEAN economic ministers tasked with working on a set of recommendations on how to deepen regional economic integration. In fact, the high-level task force recommended that the idea of an ASEAN economic community be formalised as an end goal of ASEAN economic integration. Many action measures and deadlines were spelled out. At the same time, this high-level task force also agreed that free trade agreements with ASEAN dialogue partners were to be negotiated to complement and supplement uh, economic development of ASEAN. Today, with growing anti-globalization and protectionist sentiments across the world, as well as an unpredictable Trump administration in the US and a European Union distracted by internal problems, it has become an imperative to maintain economic growth for continued stability and prosperity in ASEAN. As such, intra-ASEAN initiatives like the AEC, as well as regional initiatives such as the RCEP or the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, will be the cornerstone in making ASEAN the bulwark of an outward-looking Southeast Asia championing trade liberalisation and engagement with the rest of the world. If ASEAN is to prosper for another 50 years, it must tackle difficult questions about how to sustain its economic integration, navigate the accelerating pace of technological change and digital disruption, and channel the energy of its youthful population to enhance the relevance of Southeast Asia with the rest of the global community. The continued growth and prosperity of all member states of ASEAN is certainly the number one priority. ASEAN must aim to be one of the most digitalized and integrated goods and services powerhouses of the world. Present assessment has put ASEAN as the fastest growing internet market in the world. A recent report calculates that the region's online population is expanding by 124,000 new users every day. And this will continue at this pace for the next five years. The mobile phone connectivity is widespread in ASEAN. In fact, smartphone technology is reaching more than 50% of population in the less developed ASEAN economies, while in the more advanced ASEAN member states, 
the number is nearly 90%. However, such modernization and technology came with their challenges and disruption. For example, the traditional way of doing things, especially with regard to employment in the manufacturing industries, has been transformed. Therefore, in terms of job creation, we have to ensure that the ASEAN population is equipped with the right skills for the digital age. To this end, there is an urgent need to update school curriculum, retrain teachers, bring computer and internet not only to rural areas, but also to urban lower middle class and the blue collar workers for a complete digital inclusion. Our research shows that in 2014, there were more than a million Filipino workers in call centers and IT related work in the Philippines. Today, the Philippines can accommodate at least 2 million of these qualified personnel, but it is not easy to find them. Some say they are all in Singapore, but it's not true. In Thailand, the tourism and hospitality industry is facing a shortage of qualified graduates to hire. One number that we saw was that up to 200,000 graduates coming out into the job market, only about 20% can be employed by the hospitality industry in Thailand. Why? Because they are not well trained to tackle the new way of doing business and the new way of uh, executing transaction in the private sector. So, it is not that there are no high school graduates or university graduates. The problem is a mismatch of supply and demand. Mindset change is necessary to have the right schooling and skill sets in this age of the internet and new media. Customs and traditions are not easy to overcome. And then, there may also be other issues related to wider participation in policy deliberation and expectation of accountability and transparency. As we see information technology improves across ASEAN, and as we see the ASEAN community being implemented day to day, the people in the towns of northern Myanmar and those in the far-flung provinces of the Indonesian and Philippine archipelagos will become more aware of job opportunity in other parts of ASEAN, leading to more intensified migration of people across the entire Southeast Asia. This will make ASEAN more dynamic with regard to the movement of people. It will also mean more drug and human trafficking and other forms of transnational crime. In the next 50 years, the ASEAN governments have to contend with more migrant workers and professionals, as well as business people traveling frequently across ASEAN member states. Yet, not enough is presently paid, not enough attention is presently paid to dealing with this issue for the long term. A stronger framework of cooperation in tackling transnational crime and managing the flows of worker is required. What are the applicable legal regimes? We do not have them yet. ASEAN member states are still caught up with arguing about sovereignty issues. The problems seem to be getting acute. Violent extremism and terrorist activities need to be checked and the threats eradicated. This requires enhanced cross-border cooperation and effective legal measures. Considering the geography of the region and the fact that we are now equipped with increasingly sophisticated, sophisticated technology, only a concerted ASEAN agenda will prevent ASEAN from having more security, security dilemmas like that in Malawi in the southern Philippines. Recently, we have seen the situation in 
the northwestern part of Myanmar deteriorating. Terror groups in the Middle East have started to voice support for the Muslim population there and to urge attacks on the Myanmar government. Urgent action is needed to check violent extremism from spreading. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, apart from these internal challenges I have outlined, there are the geopolitics and prevailing strategic and security circumstances as well. The, severe, the diversity of ASEAN culture, history and society is well known. Going forward, how the 10 ASEAN member states manage external relations for ASEAN will decide its enduring qualities and effectiveness. Will it be a regionalism revolving around a particularly strong regional power or harking back to the old ASEAN Zogfan initiative of the 1970s? Zogfan stands for Zone of Peace, Neutrality and Freedom. Zone of Peace, Freedom and Neutrality. Or could it be an orientation to preserve the existing international order as we know it today, with ASEAN able to play a balancing role? There is little ASEAN can do with regard to domestic pressure in ASEAN member states. However, I'm hoping that through top-level leadership socialization and the intensive networking among ASEAN member states and between ASEAN and its dialogue partners, there could be more coherent actions among the statesmen and stateswomen of ASEAN to look at the benefit of collective actions and policy based on ASEAN centrality. The ability of ASEAN in convening meetings with the major powers and in shaping the regional security architecture illustrates not so much the influence and strength of ASEAN, but the value the other external powers attach to preserving ASEAN's role as an honest broker in managing their competing interests. A failure of ASEAN member states to hang together will lead to a situation where each of them can be hung separately, resulting in potentially serious, serious damage to ASEAN's standing, ASEAN's utility and ASEAN's future. In other words, the challenge is for ASEAN member states to keep expressing their respective national interests and the regional ego manifesting as ASEAN. Basically, what it means is that each ASEAN member state wear two hats. At appropriate occasion, one of these hats will be kept in the cupboard. From my observation, I can sense that if leaders in ASEAN can rise to the occasion and stress the need for ASEAN unity and adherence to established principles of ASEAN diplomacy, over the past five decades, there will be resonance among all the ASEAN heads of government. The people of ASEAN may not fully appreciate the benefit of the envisioned ASEAN community, but they can see the difference between themselves and the external parties, which all have only their own respective motives that might adversely affect the autonomy of action and independence of the respective ASEAN states. Ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN is not perfect. Community building is an ongoing learning process. There is no alternative to this intergovernmental regional organization which enable the Southeast Asian nation to engage external powers and countries beyond the immediate neighborhood. We need to concretize ASEAN's visionary plans to realize an open, inclusive and peaceful region to secure its future. ASEAN has already passed through the hardest part of surviving 
various crises in its earlier history. ASEAN has a resilience not fully understood by outsiders. ASEAN has the advantage of a strategic location and a structure which can be flexible and purpose-specific. 50 years of ASEAN has given us a collective experience which cannot be underrated nor be dispensed with. In reality, politics cannot be ignored, but good politics has brought ASEAN to where it is now. Surely, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. In summary, three key issues need to be considered for the future of ASEAN for the next 50 years at least. One, growth. Two, technology. And three, the youthful population of ASEAN. Economic growth is critical as the engine that drives rising incomes and prosperity, thereby ensuring political stability and progress. ASEAN as a whole has a good record in recent years, growing by around 5% a year ushering in the rise of a huge middle class. ASEAN still can perform better. Many analysts say the potential growth of ASEAN can reach 7% if member states align their interests with the ASEAN community agenda. To achieve 7% growth, the region must not only focus on individual national issues, such as infrastructure and education, but also to issues of regional importance, intra-ASEAN initiatives like the AEC, as well as regional initiatives such as RCEP, will contribute to a more resilient ASEAN. Technology is the second issue to be considered. ASEAN celebrate 50th anniversary this year. The world stands on the cusps of the fourth industrial revolution, driven by technology such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomous vehicles, mobile internet, and accelerating progress in genetics, material science, and ultra-cheap automation. ASEAN has the potential to enter the top five digital economies in the world by 2025, according to our research. Moreover, implementation of a radical digital agenda could add US dollar one trillion to the region's GDP over the next 10 years. With a large and youthful population increasingly equipped with smartphones, ASEAN has the opportunity to pioneer the development of new digital services, especially advanced mobile financial services and e-commerce. Youth is vital for ASEAN's future. Coupled with stable economic growth, ASEAN currently enjoys a demographic sweet spot, as the scholar put it. The governments of ASEAN member states must take the right measures today, such as restructuring the educational curriculum to ensure that youth are better prepared to take on the jobs of the future. This must happen before the population of ASEAN start to age around 2025. The majority of the 630 million citizens of ASEAN are still relatively young. Although in the case of Singapore and maybe even Thailand, aging has already started. As the working population grows in number, it will not only boost the region's spending, but also increase its savings and hence its capacity to invest. Investment must be made in human capital. To maintain dynamic growth, we cannot rely on natural resources and unskilled labour, but have to thrive towards sustainable development and better quality growth in order to move up the value chain.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention. I am now happy to take your comments and questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador Ong King Yong. Um, the floor is now open uh, to questions from the audience. Just please state your affiliation, and there should be a microphone that's floating around. Uh, the floor is open, please. This is the traditional lull you know, before all the questions come, but let me just kick it off then. It's okay. Um, is there any questions from the? If not, I'll, I'll, I'll have the first question. That's the prerogative of uh, being here. Um, we've seen, of course, in the European Union, the Brexit uh, situation, and there are sentiments in, around the world that perhaps regionalism has outlived its significance. Um, if ASEAN were to continue to be uh, this organization for this region for the next 50 years, um, what are some of the ways you suggest that um, ASEAN should uh, try to outreach more, I guess, the people of ASEAN to make them feel that they are the beneficiaries of this regional process? What more could be done uh, for us to, to, to become truly people-centered, if I, if I may put it that way? Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you. You know, I was Secretary General from 2003 to the end of 2007. And every year, the leaders say, make ASEAN people more aware of ASEAN community and ASEAN benefits. And after my tenure, it was Dr. Surin Pisuan and then Ambassador Li Longming. He's coming to the end of his five-year term. And we are still talking about increasing awareness of ASEAN population uh, with regard to ASEAN community. I think we have to seriously examine our uh, respective uh, agenda and action plan and I don't think that the ASEAN people don't know about ASEAN. Yeah. Uh, in the last 10 years since I stepped down as Secretary General, I averaged about 50 meetings and conferences a year to uh, talk about ASEAN. And almost no repeat of the audiences. So if you just add them up, 200 to 300 per event, it, there are several thousand people, young people who now come into the job market and understand what ASEAN is uh, doing. Why we still have this problem? I think the population of today wanted to see more specific activities relating to their day-to-day -day life. Yeah. And I think one of the things we can do to explain how day-to-day -day life of ASEAN citizens have been changed by ASEAN is that it's now very easy to travel. Uh, everybody can fly, they say. Yeah, from $50 to a few hundred dollars, you can go to any part of ASEAN. Yeah, you don't need a visa. In some cases, local authority may interpret the visa-free uh, rule quite differently, but generally speaking, uh, we have more than 100 million tourists going around ASEAN. So, how can it be that there is no benefit for our ordinary ASEAN people? So, the question now is, how do we actually customize our messaging, our uh, statements, and have more of our political leaders to talk about ASEAN when they go about in their uh, grassroots activities, and also to directly relate what ASEAN is doing to the life of our people? I would like to encourage the media friends to stop publishing photographs in the newspaper of ASEAN leaders sitting around, nice, beautiful conference room, and not doing anything more than that. Actually, that's not true. Yeah? But I agree, there is always this pressure on our uh, officials and policy makers to do more to reach out to the people. So we should try. I was telling uh, Surya just now that uh, if you look at the uh, uh, official records in ASEAN uh, countries, you'll be shocked to know that there are so many NGOs and civil society organizations. In the Philippines, the registered uh, civil society groups come close to half a million for a population of 100 million people in the Philippines. In Indonesia, what we could uncover from our search for records was close to 300,000 to 400,000 
And I don't know how many in Thailand, how many in uh, the other countries in the region. So if you look at it, there are more than a million NGOs and civil society organizations. What have our leader done to connect with these people? So perhaps uh, in the case of Singapore Championship next year and Thailand Championship of ASEAN in 2019, we can bring more people to the national stadiums of our country and have our leaders to, to talk to them and maybe give them each a nice message uh, of why ASEAN matter to their life. Thank you. Thank you. Floor is open, please, for questions from the floor. Yes, in the back. Uh, in case that you don't recognize me, my name is Kitty. Was yes, there? of course, I know you, Kitty. <laughs> he was I, a ASEAN I general to, to of Thailand during my time. <laughs> yes. The he gave me a hard time all the time. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my question would be about the role of the Secretary General. Uh, if I remember correctly, you are the first one, first Secretary General who was promoted ministerial level. I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm right or not, but uh, I think, I think you, you have done a lot of good things during your, your term. Uh, Dr. Surin followed, and with uh, his uh, real foreign minister's uh, background, he, he did a lot as well, and now Vietnamese is doing. Uh, we, ASEAN, has been evasive to be supranational. So, uh, what I understand is that even though uh, our Secretary General is, uh, is at uh, ministerial level, uh, he or she has to toe the line. He or she can speak on behalf of ASEAN uh, well, with the uh, uh, from the background of uh, ASEAN decision and statement and so on and so forth. But again, from time to time, he or she could be criticized by our ministers or even our leaders. But what, what, what do you see uh, from your point of view uh, uh, 17 years ago or, uh, whether Sekjen has played enough constructive role for ASEAN and would it be would Secretary General be, uh, would play a stronger low role in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Yes, I think the Secretary General can definitely play a more active role. Actually, if you look at the whole ASEAN structure, the whole of the 630 million people, there is only one guy officially appointed to be Mr. ASEAN, and that is the Secretary General of ASEAN. And if you look at the ASEAN uh, Charter, the green leader booklet that the Dr. Surin showed you in the video. There are several uh, sentences devoted to what the ASEAN Secretary General can do. And he is the only guy who can represent ASEAN, ASEAN, not our respective member countries, in any of the international and regional forums. So I remember when I went to the UN uh, during my time as Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, uh, first was Kofi Annan, later was uh, Ban Ki-moon, actually did the right protocol yeah, because they have been Secretary General of the UN and I'm sure UN member gave them a hard time too. So with us appearing at the UN, uh, they give us the seat of uh, honour and some of the ASEAN member countries objected to it. Uh, and uh, I don't want to mention names, but a few of them were ticked off by the Secretary General of UN. Personally, I think Mr. Kofi Annan did that. He says, excuse me, who is representing ASEAN here? You from Singapore, from Thailand, Malaysia, or what? Nobody. Only the Secretary General of ASEAN. So this fact is not well known. And I think as Secretary General, as our professional ethics, whether it is my predecessor or my successor, we don't always blow this up. But the ASEAN leaders who approve the ASEAN Charter recognize that there is only one representative of ASEAN at this moment around the world. And today we have many ASEAN centers and institutions. Some of them have 
what they call director generals and secretary generals, yeah, and they represent ASEAN also. But some of our officials in member countries still cannot accept this. I think maybe the next part of my career, I should spend time doing lecture on ASEAN protocol. <laughs> yeah, and actually, if you look at the very important document called the Protocol on Rights and Privileges for ASEAN. Uh, there is also a recognition that the ASEAN Secretary General, first of all, he is of a ministerial rank and he should be accorded the treatment accorded to any ministerial diplomatic representative from any countries around the world. So, we, in terms of protocol, in terms of ceremony, can be said to be quite well uh, placed. The problem is that we are all very well-trained diplomats and uh, Southeast Asian. We don't try to uh, talk over our political appointees because after all they are elected by the people. Right? We are appointed by our respective uh, 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 ministers. So the guy who got the popular vote must be allowed to say more and be more authoritative. However, I think over the coming years, the Secretary General can definitely do more because more and more intergovernmental and uh, cooperation across, uh, more and more intergovernmental business and cooperation across uh, boundaries have to be undertaken by ASEAN. And who is a representative? It's the Secretary General. Of course, before he go on any mission, I think it would be wise of him to obtain the mandate uh, how far he can go and what he can do. Uh, during my time, what I try to do is to push the envelope as far as I can. Uh, if there is an opportunity, for example, ASEAN leaders meeting business leaders, uh, Mr. Narong Chai was also one of them, uh, instead of having half an hour for all these leaders to meet the business people, I try to change it to one hour. For the ASEAN leaders meeting with civil society, 15 minutes. Yeah, and all these friends from the civil society come from all parts of ASEAN, 15 minutes. You know how we are in terms of opening our remarks. Congratulate people, thank people. By the time that is done, it's 15 minutes. So I try to stretch it to half an hour. Later, I put it 45 minutes. And finally, before I left my job in 2007, one hour. So that's what I did. Within the practical arena, I can do this. I cannot say, Oh, Excellency, you uh, must meet this civil society leader. Yeah. Some leaders don't want to meet the civil society leader because they say, in their country, they criticize the leader and uh, raise protests in the street. Okay, I can understand. Yeah, but I think what the Secretary General can do is definitely to highlight a bit more of what ASEAN is all about. Uh, push the envelope a little bit, yeah. And more importantly, I think the most uh, effective part that the Secretary General can play would be to coordinate across the ASEAN family. We have today more than 32 sectors, you know, uh, from minister dealing with cooperatives to minister dealing with defence and combating terrorists. 32 and if you count the other smaller group, maybe another 30. So what can ASEAN Secretary General do? Make sure that all our parts talk to each other, coordinate better. Thank you. And by the way, I wasn't the first uh, Secretary General with a full ministerial status. It started with Mr. Ajit Singh from Malaysia. Then he was succeeded by uh, Mr. Severino, uh, Rodolfo Celebrino in uh, uh, from the Philippines, and then me. So I was number three, if you like, in this new structure. Uh, the third person after uh, Ajit Singh of Malaysia and uh, uh, Rod Severino of uh, Philippines. So we are now having the Secretary General from uh, Vietnam, and after him, next January, we will have a new Secretary General from Brunei because the clock starts again. 
we go by alphabetical order in the English language. I don't know, other alphabetical order, maybe there are some different uh, arrangement. But we start with Brunei again, uh, and then followed by Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, uh, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, in that order. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps one more question from, from the floor. Um, if, if not, um, I'd yeah, like to... One there. Is there one? Nine. Yeah. My name is Kabiru. Yeah. Okay. Kabiru Bala from the Embassy of Nigeria. Now, looking at the pictures of the Secretary Generals in the last 50 years, I have not seen a lady Secretary General. Do you see, maybe in the next 50 years, come in? A secretary general from the other gender. Thank you. Of course, of course. We came close to one female secretary general. But, yeah, as somebody said, she was voted out internally before even the name was submitted. So I think there are plenty of opportunity for uh, uh, women to go up the ASEAN ladder. In fact, if you would like, you look at the uh, leaders of uh, official meetings, uh, there are quite a few uh, ladies from ASEAN countries. You cannot deny them half their sky. So I feel that that will be coming. Uh, we have, in fact, an ASEAN sectoral body on ministers for women affairs meeting. So they are not to be easily uh, uh, neglected. Yeah? And more and more, uh, they are going to be in your uh, meetings and your uh, events. The ASEAN Secretariat today has about 250 staff. If you go there anytime and you ask for a, a turnout, uh, I think almost 65, 70% are women. So we are under their control. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I think that will conclude the, um, the question and answer session. And just to confirm, um, just another statistic, in, in my department, it's 95% women. So, so uh, I am I'm definitely under control um, here. And, and with that uh, Q&A, I'd like to thank, uh, applaud again uh, to um, Secretary General, uh, Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, please. And, and please remain on stage for the next program. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies, and everybody for your kind participation. Now, uh, may I please invite His Excellency Ambassador Pradap Pibun Songkram onto the stage to kindly present the gift of appreciation to His Excellency Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, please. And also, um, in addition to the gift of appreciation, we would like to also invite Ambassador Pradap to also kindly uh, present the ASEAN Charter and the ASEAN Vision 2025 in Braille versions, please. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies. Uh, please kindly remain on the stage for the photo session. And now to join their Excellencies for a group photo, may I please invite onto the stage Dr. Surya Jinda Wong, Her Excellency Mrs. Chua Seo San, Ambassador of Singapore. His Excellency Mr. U Mio Min Tan, Ambassador of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar. Ms. Mary Ann Padua, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Philippines. Mr. Tafero Seo Tikno, Deputy Chief of Mission of Indonesia, Mr. Maud Faisal bin Razali, Chargé Affairs of Malaysia, Mr. Ukam Sangkau Misai, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Lao PDR, Mr. Kwong Trung, First Secretary of Vietnam, and Ms. Pei Wei Ko, Second Secretary of Brunam, Jerusalem.
Thank you very much, Your Excellencies.